All right. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the show. John Abbas here. And uh, man, I have an incredible guest today. This is someone that I have looked up to for almost 15 years. His first book um, really just helped me through a very, very dark time in my business. Um, probably the scariest time in my entire life. It was during the Great Recession. And his book, to a degree, actually saved me. So I've I've looked up to him like a celebrity for a very long time. And I get into the whole story in the interview, but I just I'm super, super excited to let you listen to it. His name is Bob Berg. And he is the best-selling author of the book, Endless Referrals. And this book has helped thousands of entrepreneurs generate millions and millions of dollars in income for them and for their families. And it's really cool because he one-upped himself. Like this book was the gold standard of sales for a very long time. And he actually one-upped himself by writing The Go-Giver. That was his latest book, and this book became an international bestseller. It sold over a million copies and was really instrumental in shifting the mindset around sales from a what-can-I-get mindset to a what-can-I-give mindset. He took the term go-getter, which we all know, and turned it into go-giver, and it became just a huge saying. And today... Bob speaks to audiences globally, ranging from 50 people, like little private masterminds for corporations, to over 20,000 people. And he's been named one of the 30 most important leaders in the world by the American Management Association. Now, in this interview, why I'm so excited is we just we talk a little bit about his story, which is an awesome story, but we really deep dive into the core of his book. The Go-Giver, which the core is the five laws of the Go-Giver, Go-Giver, sorry. And then as a special bonus, he sheds light on what is called the golden rule of sales. And this is this rule is guaranteed to multiply your income if you can just follow and implement it. So I'm just excited to get into the interview. If you are watching this interview on YouTube, look, do me a favor, please hit the subscribe button, turn on your notifications. If you are listening to this interview, also hit the subscribe button. If you enjoy the interview, leave a review. It means a lot. Uh, Only do it if you enjoy it, though. So without further ado, please help me welcome Mr. Bob Berg. All right. Mr. Bob Berg, thank you so much for being on the Mentor Nation podcast. Um, it's a pleasure to have you, and I'm very excited for this interview. Oh, my pleasure. It's great to be with you, John. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So before I have you share some of your unbelievable wisdom, I have to tell a story. I, I want you and also the audience to know kind of why I'm so excited about this interview in particular. So um, 2007... I own, I bought a coffee shop. I, I bought a huge cafe in Las Vegas. And it, we did really, really, it was awesome. It was a great business. But about a year later, the recession hit and we, mm-hmm. we got absolutely crushed. And mm-hmm. we were looking for any way to be able to get more customers in the door because it was just people were brewing coffee at home. They were scared to sure. death. And I came across your book, um, Endless Referrals, in 2007, and I read it, and I applied, no joke, every single thing. And it was my Bible for a full (laughs) year. And and you became my favorite author on sales, and I'll explain a little why uh, just a little bit later. And then it's just so funny, several years later, I was a top producer in a direct sales company. Uh, The name of the company was ACN, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with. Oh, sure. The founder, Greg Provenzano, yeah. had an all-hands call, and he was like, if you read one book in your life, you better go get The Go-Giver. And wow. So we all picked it up. We read oh, it, nice. and it was just an amazing, just an amazing book. So uh, it's kind of like having your favorite like actor on an interview. <laughs> you know, it's oh, kind of it's one very, of those things. But Very nice. Thank you for sharing that with me. I, I didn't realize that uh, Greg had, had uh, recommended the book. And thank every you year. for sharing every year. how you benefited from uh, endless referrals and so forth. I, it means a lot to me. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, and it really does, and I'm excited to get into the content of The Go-Giver. Um, I had a whole list of interview questions, and then I went to your website, 
and the recommended questions were better than my questions. And so No, I, you ask any <laughs> ask anything you want. We like to make it easy to, to work yeah. with us. So but you ask anything you want. That's that's yeah. fine. Well, I want to start if you could um just could you share a little bit about how you got into the profession of selling? Yeah, I, I actually began as a broadcaster. I was first on radio and then television. Uh, I was the late night news guy for a, a very, very small ABC uh, network affiliate in the Midwestern United States. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I wasn't really that good at it. And it was pretty obvious I wasn't going to go anywhere, you know, uh, too far. <laughs> there. And, um, and so I started to, to sell just as a way to make some extra money. Cause I, you know, again, I was in a small market and, and, uh, so it seemed like the thing to do. The challenge was that I had no formal sales training or instruction mm. and the company where I was working their their training was, we'll say, neg we'll say <laughs> negligible. And of course, what I mean is non-existent. Yeah. yeah. And right. So I really floundered for the first few months. Um, and then I was in a bookstore one day and came across two books on, on sales, which it doesn't seem like a big deal now, but this is 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And while well, they had, of course, sales books, it, it was not as prevalent as it is, as it is today. And uh, so I felt very fortunate to come across those. One was by Zig Ziglar and one was by Tom Hopkins, two icons in the yep. sales space, certainly. And uh, I got the books and you know, I always say I, I didn't read them. I devoured them. And I would come home every night after uh, the day's work and I would just mm -hmm. until the wee hours of the morning, I would read and study and highlight and underline and take notes and dog ear the pages and practice and drill and rehearse. And, and within a few weeks, my sales really took off. And you think, wow, you know, could that, uh, what, you know, obviously there was no difference in, in where I was three weeks earlier than I right. was three weeks later, other than I had a methodology. I had a mm -hmm. way of, of doing something, a system, if you will. And right. you know, personally, I define, and I'm not saying I have the definition, but the way I define a system is the process of predictably achieving a goal based on a logical and specific set of how-to principles, the key being predictability, right? If, if it's been right. proven that by doing A, you'll get the desired results of B, then you know that all you need to do is A and continue to do A and continue to do A and eventually you'll get the desired results of B. So that really encouraged me. That said, okay, yeah, you can do this if you know how. So I became sort of a sales junkie at that point. I mean, I started reading everything I could and listening to, uh, this is how long ago it was, cassette tape albums, right? And, yeah. one step above an eight track tape. And, <laughs> and so, um, I, as part of, of learning sales, you also start really learning about personal development. That's right. right. So I started getting the books that I'm sure you have in your library, the how to win friends and influence people. Yes, and they can grow rich and the yep. magic of thinking big and the psycho cybernetics and the as a man thinking, and, and you know, all the classics. And, um, and which really help us build ourselves from the inside out. You know, we know that growth comes on the inside. Yes, it's sir. an inside job. It manifests outwardly, right? But it starts in here. And, uh, or I should say in here, right? Mm -hmm. in, in here. And, and you know, I, I eventually, I just, you know, work my way up to sales manager of another company years later. And after that started to uh, show others what was, what was working for me and the people I was leading. And uh, eventually, you know, what did they used to say in the old Seinfeld show? Yada, yada, yada. 30 years later, here we are. I mean, absolutely. So I'm excited <laughs> to, to talk about the go-giver today. Um, you're, so there's a lot of sales books out there. Zig Ziglar is one of my idols, but yeah. I don't know what it was. It was something about your books resonated with me and just like how I was naturally as a person. Like I read books, even Tom Hopkins, right? I love him to death, but I read, you know, just a lot of the closing techniques and it just felt like it was going against the grain. Well, it was a different time too. That's right. Where it was, you know, and there, so their, their success, the, the principles were, were spot on different mm, strategies, <laughs> techniques, tactics, and so forth probably today wouldn't be at, you know, so, so when you read those books, you know, what you do is you read for the principles they hold, the service right. to others, the way that you're focused on listening. And, and then you kind of let some of the older tactics kind of go a little bit. And 
Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So can you share with everybody a little bit about The Go Giver Way? What, what's the premise of the book? What inspired you to write that book? Yeah, so uh, basically, you know, the, the premise is simply that shifting your focus, and this is really the key, shifting your focus from getting to giving. And when we say mm-hmm. giving in this context, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing immense value to others, understanding that doing so is not only a, um, a, a more fulfilling way of, of doing business, it's actually the most financially profitable way as well. And not for some you know, way out there, woo-woo type of magical, mystical reasons. No, it actually makes logical sense. It's right. very rational when you think about it, because when you're that person, that something maybe all too rare person who can take your focus off of yourself and actually place it on another person, bringing value to their life, making, you know, helping solve their challenges, uh, making their life better, helping them come closer to happiness, what have you. Well, people feel good about you. People want That's to right. get to know you. They like you. They trust you. They want to be in a relationship with you. They want to buy from you. They want to refer you to, to others. So, so it's really a, you know, a matter of understanding that as you do that, it's, it's very natural for it, to, you know, for it to come right back to you. This is why you know, John David Mann, my awesome co-author, why we say that money is simply an echo of value. You know, it's the, it's the thunder, if you will, to values lightning, which means nothing more than that the focus must be on <clears throat> the value you bring to others. The money you receive is simply a very natural result right. of the value you provide. Uh, I love that. That's such great advice. Now, I know in your book, um, you have five laws, and I was just wondering if you could touch on those five laws um, for the audience listening today, because most of the audience that listen here are entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, mm-hmm. um, six figures to three to four million dollar range. And so all of them are in a place where they can grasp these concepts and they, sure. they want to scale. And so I think mm-hmm. that these five laws are, are very, very important. Uh, thank you. So the laws themselves are the laws of value, compensation, influence, authenticity, and receptivity. The law of value says your true worth, in the business sense, of course, your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment, which when you think about it, sounds kind of counterintuitive when you first hear it, right? You have more in value than I take in payment. I mean, that sounds all nicey-nice and everything. It also sounds like a recipe for bankruptcy, right? So- you know, how do, we, how do we do that? And, and so we simply have to understand the difference between price and value. Um, price is a dollar amount. It's a dollar figure. It's finite. It is what it is, right? Value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or mm. desirability of a thing, of something to the end user or beholder. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, service? Right concept, idea that brings so much worth to a person that they will willingly exchange their money for it and be glad they did while you, the entrepreneur or salesperson, makes a very healthy uh, profit. I often use on a, and this is just a very, very basic example, the person you hire as an accountant to do your taxes and she charges you a thousand dollars and that's her, uh, her fee, literally her price, a thousand dollars. But what's the value she provides you? Well, uh, she saves you five thousand yep. dollars on taxes. She saves you countless hours of time, freeing you up to do what you'd rather be doing and what you can do more productively. Uh, and she um, provides you and your family with the security and the peace of mind of knowing it was done correctly. So we see here that again, while price is finite, value can be both concrete in terms of the five thousand dollars, but it can also be very conceptual in terms of the hours and the peace of mind, which probably holds more value to you than even the, you know, the $5,000 savings. So what she did is she gave you well over $5,000 yep. in value in exchange for a thousand dollar price. So you feel great about it, obviously. And she made a very healthy profit because to her, it was worth it to her to lease out her time, her knowledge, her wisdom, her energy in exchange for that thousand dollars. Right. And you have a a great quote that I love. It's if you sell on price, you're a commodity. When you sell on value, you're a resource. Yeah. And and really that's about, you know, the fact that even let's say with the accountant, okay, is, what she provided in value is great, obviously, mm-hmm. 
but it, it, it doesn't in and of itself distinguish her from any other accountant because any accountant, that's by the very nature of the thing, the intrinsic value right. of an accountant, that's what they do. So how does she distinguish herself so that it's, because let's face it, if, if a prospective customer or client cannot distinguish between any two or more product services or salespeople, what have you, well, it's naturally going to come down to who has the lowest price. That's right. Price. Yes, sir. Right. And that's where the commodity aspect comes in as opposed. So you've got to, uh, you know, how do you, how do you communicate additional value? Well, the short answer is you become that additional value. <laughs> And that's really in the entire customer experience. And while there are probably hundreds of ways to be able to communicate that additional value, mm -hmm. they tend to come down to five what we call elements of value. So within the law of value, there are five elements of value. And these are simply excellence, consistency, attention, empathy, and appreciation. And to the degree mm -hmm. that you and, and those on your team can communicate uh, one or more, hopefully all five of them at every touch right. point. So from the time you meet that person, whether it's an inbounder, outbounder, meeting somewhere, wherever you meet that person, through the relationship building process, the follow up, the follow through, the sales process, the um, referral process, you know, to the degree you do that, that's the degree you take your competition and price mm -hmm. out of the picture. Oh, I, so much, so much value in this. So now that's, that was the first law. Is that, that correct? That was the first one. Yeah. Perfect. So the second one's the law of compensation. This is, you were talking about scaling earlier, mm -hmm. and this is kind of where, where that comes in. The law of compensation says your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So where law number one says to give more in value than you take in payment, law number two tells us that the more people whose lives you touch or impact with that exceptional value, the more money with which you'll be rewarded. In the story, in the parable, uh, Nicole Martin, the CEO, explained to Joe, who was the protege, mm -hmm. that law number one, the law of value, that represents your potential income. Okay, how valuable you are, but law number two represents your actual income mm. because it's the number of lives, and that's what she did in the story when she moved from being a teacher to to uh, creating that learning system for children, where she could she could now touch you know millions of lives as opposed to x number of lives in a classroom. Yeah, and I think a lot of people get stuck there. Like I think a lot of people <clears throat> will master something, but they don't know how to scale past their time that they can do themselves, right? Like yeah, exactly. they're just like, well, how do I scale it? I only have 24 hours in a day. And that's a whole other, I think, topic in and of itself. But is, can you share anything? Cause I just, I've always believed that, you know, you take any surgeon and you take Dr. Oz and if you look at their knowledge level, I mean, I can't imagine Dr. Oz is a thousand not. times smarter, but he makes a thousand times more. He's leveraged his, he's leveraged his value. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, I mean, depending upon the type of business someone has, obviously, uh, some of them can be leveraged more than others. So, for yeah. some, it's just a matter of expanding your client base and fitting as many people as, as you can as you're in, raising prices, doing whatever. It, yeah. For others, we can, let's take, for instance, in, in the story, Nicole. Uh, who was the teacher who developed that online learning system. Yes, she sir. was actually based on a woman I used to date years ago named Annette. And mm -hmm. Annette was, had a tutoring business, okay? And she did so well, she got so many referrals, she was filled up and finally had to hire additional tutors. And then got so filled up with that, she got out of the tutoring part and simply sold the services. Right. Okay. Right. So, you know, now what if, and she made a great living for herself, but what if she decided to expand even more? What she would, what would she have done? She'd have maybe licensed her tutoring and business building method, licensed or franchised it. You know what I'm saying? So absolutely, so it's only limited by our imagination and the type of business we're in, of course, but typically we can find ways to scale it even more than we are. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is just your focus on scaling. You know, a lot of people just, they're comfortable where they're at sure. and they don't want to, but that's, that's very helpful. All right. Let's get into law three. I'm excited. These are so, two. 
So law three is the law of influence. And the law of influence says your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Mm -hmm. uh, again, counterintuitive when you first hear it, maybe sounds counterproductive or even Pollyanna-ish. Uh, but yet, you know, you think about the greatest leaders you know, mm -hmm. uh, the top influencers, most productive money-earning salespeople. This is how they run their lives and conduct their business. They're always looking out for the other person, looking for ways to make the other person's life better. Um, now, let me qualify this too, because I think it can be misunderstood, and I think it's very important to, to understand. Yes, when sir. we say place other people's interests first, we're not talking about being anybody's doormat. Uh, we're not talking about being a martyr and we're not talking about being self-sacrificial. It simply is, as Joe, the protege in the story learned from several of the mentors, the yep. golden rule of, of business, of sales, of networking, what have you, is simply that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. Well, there's no faster, more powerful, or more effective way to elicit those feelings toward you from others than by genuinely moving from what we call an I focus or me focus to an other focus. Mm. Uh, looking to, as Sam, one of the mentors uh, advised Joe, to make your win all about the other person's win. And as you do this, and you do this constantly, and you do this consistently, you develop that great reputation within your marketplace, and you Absolutely. become that go-to person, and you, know, you develop what we call an army of personal walking ambassadors. Mm, I love that. That's, that's incredible. Now, I know, obviously, to be cautious of your time because you're busy. I'm sure you have a crazy day today. The last two laws, um, I wanted to touch on those, and then I had a couple of other questions. Sure. If you don't mind. Whatever you'd like. Thank you. Um, so law number four. Well, law number four is the law of authenticity. Okay. And this one says the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. And the mentor in this part of the story was Deborah Davenport, who actually yep. did this through a, a speech uh, at a symposium that Joe attended with his main mentor, Pindar. And what she really said was that <clears throat> all the skills in the world, the uh, sales skills, technical skills, people skills, as important yes, as they are, and they are, they, they are all indeed very, very important. They're also all for naught if you don't come at it from your true authentic core. But yes, when you do, right, when you show up as yourself day after day, week after week, month after month, people feel good about you. They feel right. comfortable with you. They feel safe with you because they know they're getting the same person every time and consistency is so important when it comes to building trust with people. And that is when they get to know you and like you and love you and trust you and want to be in relationship with you. So I think one of the most important aspects about showing up authentically is understanding the value you really do provide. Right. Uh, sure. Your intrinsic value as a human being, but also your market value that combination of strengths, traits, talents, and characteristics that really allows you to, to bring value to the marketplace in such a way that you will be rewarded for it. And so it's important that we understand that market value and what we really bring to the table, which can be difficult sometimes because yep. as human beings, we tend to be so emotionally close to ourselves, we can't really see right. What, right, what's so special about us. Yeah, you know, I have a question about that, especially that one, because that is my favorite personally law. And, and I find myself battling this sometimes, you know, I want to be authentic, but you know, as a business owner, you have to wear many hats, right? You have to have tough conversations and, you know, maybe you're not that type of person, right? Where you want to get onto somebody or draw the line. Like, how do you battle that when you feel like you're coming off inauthentically, even though it's you, it's just you pushing yourself out of your comfort zone to have a difficult conversation that you're not used to having. Well, I mean, there are unpleasant aspects of business. You know, we know <laughs> that. Well, you know, the, the toughest thing, I don't, you know, I, there may be some people in this world who enjoy firing other people, <laughs> but, you know, I wouldn't want to be around them. And I, and I don't think there are too many. And I've, you know, I, I've read 
autobiographies of people, of major business people, uh, who talked about how horribly difficult it was to, to fire some. I mean, it's right. right. But it doesn't mean we're not authentic. I mean, it means we have to do things we don't necessarily want to do. So we do our best to learn how to, uh, you know, let someone go in a way that, that, uh, creates a, a benevolent context for, right. for everybody and so forth. But, you know, difficult conversations are a part of life and they're a part of business and we've got to do it. Now, what would be off, what would be inauthentic is if you thought you had to become some monstrous ogre to do it because that's how they do it on TV. Okay. That, you know, that would be inauthentic, but to, to have to let someone go, but to do it in a way that you do it as tactfully and kindly uh, yeah. and uplifting as you can, even though it's still at best difficult, there's nothing inauthentic about it. It's just, just uncomfortable. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. I, I really like that. Yeah. It wasn't so much becoming an ogre, but it's like, you know, sometimes me personally, right. I'll have these thoughts and I'm like, okay, what kind of person do I want to be when I have to bring this, do I want to come off as powerful? Do I want to come off as empathetic? Do I want to, cause I just like, you don't want to, you don't want to be fake, but sure. you want to get the point across while still being yourself. And so sometimes that it seems like it can be a little difficult. But. Well, the, here's the thing. The fact that you're questioning yourself about it shows you are authentic because oh, yeah. someone who's not <laughs> wouldn't question themselves. They would just do it. Okay. Yeah. I love it. Thank you, Bob. You just, you, you solved the big problem for me personally. Um, so uh, law number five. Yeah, this is the law of receptivity. And, you know, if, if the law of value is the foundational principle, the law of receptivity is the one that sort of brings it home and completes it. Um, the, the law of receptivity says the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. And this really means nothing more. And as we highlighted in the story, yep. that, that, that yes, we breathe out, but we also have to breathe in. You just cannot sustain life, never mind thrive, if you're doing just one or the other. You can't just breathe out. You've got to breathe in. We breathe out carbon dioxide. We breathe in oxygen. We breathe out, which is giving. We breathe in, which is receiving. Giving and receiving are simply two sides of the very same coin, and they work in tandem. Now, this is despite the message we get from so much of the world around us that wants to tell us that money and prosperity and abundance is some kind of bad thing. Yep. If you have abundance and prosperity, it means someone else doesn't. No, that's not true at all. And, but that's the message we receive. And so sometimes it can be difficult to understand that you know, it's not a matter of, are you a giver or a receiver? No, you're a giver and a receiver. But you also understand the way life works is the giving comes first. The focus needs to be on the giving. You know, just as when we talked about in the story, you wouldn't go up to a fireplace and say, first, give me some fire and heat, then I'll throw on some logs and a newspaper and, and light a match. You wouldn't go up to the teller of a bank or the bank manager and say, hey, I, I want to open an account with you guys. First, though, you give me an interest payment and then I'll deposit some money. Life doesn't work that way. And successful people deal in truths and they work from a basis of, right. of, of truth. So it's you're a giver and a receiver, but you do have to allow yourself to receive. That's really powerful. And I think hopefully by now, everybody knows that they need to just go pick up your book. Um, you've expanded your book. Um, I think my final question just on your wisdom is, you know, I believe that everybody's in some sort of sales, whether you're oh, selling your child to go to bed or you're selling mm -hmm. yourself in a job interview and you train hundreds of thousands, if not millions of salespeople through your books on stage and things like that. What, what do you see is the biggest problem that, are, that holds most people back from making more money, therefore completely enhancing the quality of their life and their family? Like what, what is the one big thing that you see time and time again that if they just made a small shift, it could change everything? Well, I, I think there is something. And if, if I may, can I share a story that I think Please. illustrates it because it happened to me, which is what, what put me in the right direction. Absolutely. And this was a couple of years after I began really learning sales and was having some success with it. But I started with, a, started with another company selling a high-end, high-ticket uh, product. Mm -hmm. 
And I was in a slump, or I was in a really bad slump. And I remember coming back from a, an appointment in which the sale did not happen because of my own ineptness and, and so forth. And, and I must have looked really discouraged or disgusted or, or something with myself because one of the older uh, people there at the company, and he wasn't in the sales department, I think it was in the engineering department or something. So he wasn't even a salesperson. Um, but he was one of these people, he didn't say much, but whenever he did, it was typically profound, right? So when he said to me, Berg, he was a, he was a last name kind of guy. He, so he said, Berg, can I give you some advice? And I said, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> you do. And he said, if you want to make a lot of money in sales, he said, don't have making money as your target. Your target is serving others. Now, when you hit the target, he said, you'll get a reward and that reward will come in the form of money and you can do with that money whatever you choose. But never forget, he said, the, 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 the money is simply the reward for hitting the target. It ain't the target itself. Your target is serving others. And this is where I really, it really hit me big time that great salesmanship is never about the salesperson. Great salesmanship is never even about the product or service itself, as important as that is, which I think is a big mistake salespeople make. Great yep. salesmanship is about the other person. Very simple, but that's what it's about. It's about the other person. It's how they will benefit from the product or service working with you. It's how their life will be touched and made better just by knowing you and doing business with you. Once we understand that, we're nine steps ahead of the game in a 10-step game. And there you have it, guys. I mean, this is from someone that trains tens of thousands of salespeople all over the world is the one thing. That's, that's just, it's really powerful. And I appreciate you sharing that. And I know we're short on time, but I want, I, I really want people to be able to follow your work, connect with you. I know you do some incredible things. You have a Facebook group where every Thursday you go live. I want everybody to be able to just have access and know where to find your your best work and your latest and greatest work. So can you just share where is the best place to follow you, the best place to get your books, the best place to follow your latest and greatest content and how people can access that. And I'll put that in the show notes as well. Okay. The, um, the, the best place to go is simply Berg, B U R G dot com. And <laughs> while they're there, they can uh, check out any of the books, reading a, a chapter first to see if they like where it's headed uh, if they scroll down to the bottom of the page, they'll, they'll see where I am online. They can connect with me on social media. Uh, I also have a new um, free four-video mini course we just produced mm. called Selling the Go-Giver Way, which takes the concept of the go-giver and uh, puts it directly to a sales presentation, including how to work within objections in order to advance the sale and uh, a whole bunch of things. And they can get that at selling the go giver way, or if they go to Berg.com, B-U-R-G, they can find it there. Oh, that's awesome. Did, uh, did that domain cost you a lot of money? Berg.com? No, I got it actually very, very, very early when the first, uh, when, when the internet first started opening <laughs> up to everybody, I knew nothing about it, but fortunately a person who I did know who was very internet savvy said, uh, Bob, you want to get Berg.com? I said, nah, this internet thing's never going to actually, <laughs> they said, just trust me, do it anyway, do it, do it for me. And uh, so I got in, boy, was that, was I glad I did. Oh man, do you, do you ever get like offers or inquiries? Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's, yeah. that's yeah, the, the one word <laughs> domains are yeah. almost impossible to find at like less than five figures. It's really my, crazy. My selling price is many millions for that. <laughs> hey, somebody might be in the market for it. You just never know. <laughs> Maybe they want to make a, a remake of like, the Titanic hitting the iceberg or something. <laughs> That's you, right. <laughs> you, you never know. Bob, it has been an absolute pleasure. I just, I just want to say thank you for your time and just your, your wisdom and your knowledge and sharing with everybody here today. I hope whenever you write your next book or just whatever your next project is, we can have you on here again just to talk a little bit about that and, and, and share, share that with everybody as well. So thank no, you for your I time. I love it. Thank you, John. Thank you for all you do. I appreciate you. Absolutely. 